When I first started doing our brain imaging work, I was so excited, but got a lot of criticism from my colleagues who said the scans were just for research and psychiatrists shouldn't be using them in clinical practice, even though we were still making diagnoses like they did in 1840 when Abraham Lincoln was depressed. Did you know that Lincoln suffered from periods of severe depression, including being suicidal at least twice in his life? After a political setback in the winter of 1840, Lincoln's depression was so severe, his friends brought him to see Dr. Anson Henry. And how did Dr. Henry diagnose Lincoln with melancholia, or depression? He talked to him, looked at him, and looked for symptom clusters. Then he diagnosed and treated him without any biological data. That was 178 years ago, and it's the same way most people like Chase are diagnosed today. Think about it. Why are psychiatrists the only medical doctors who virtually never look at the organ they treat? Cardiologists look, neurologists look, orthopedic doctors look. In fact, all other medical specialists look, but psychiatrists are handicapped and make diagnoses based on whatever symptoms you report. Can you really imagine a future of psychiatry without looking at the brain? I knew we could be better, but at the time, I had two personal flaws that really got in my way. One, I wanted to be liked, but that doesn't happen to people who want to change a paradigm. Two, I hated conflict. It made me feel bad. But that all changed late one night in April 1995 when I got a call from my sister-in-law, Sherry, who told me that my nine-year-old godson, Andrew, who's also my nephew, attacked a little girl on the baseball field that day for no particular reason. I said, excuse me? Sherry said, Danny, he's different. He's mean. He never smiles anymore. I went into his room today and found two pictures he had drawn. One of them, he was hanging from a tree. In the other picture, he was shooting other children. In retrospect, Andrew was Columbine. Sandy Hook, or Parkland, Florida, waiting to happen. I told Sherry I wanted to see him the next day. When I walked into my office and saw Andrew sitting on my couch, my heart melted. I love this child, was so worried about him. I said, buddy, what's going on? He said, Uncle Danny, I'm mad all the time and I don't know why. I asked, is anybody hurting you? He said, no. Is anybody teasing you? And he said, no. Is anybody touching you in places they shouldn't be touching you? I was searching for answers to his senseless behavior and he said no. My first thought was, you have to scan him. My next thought was, you want to scan everybody. <laughs> Maybe this was a psychological problem. Then all of a sudden, the rational voice in my head said, stop it. Nine-year-old children do not attack people for no reason. Scan him if his brain is normal then you can explore other reasons for his violent behavior. I went with Andrew to the imaging center and held his hand while he held his teddy bear and got scanned. When his brain scan came up on the computer screen, Andrew was missing the function of his left temporal lobe. It turned out he had a cyst the size of a golf ball occupying the space where his temporal lobe should have been. By that time in 1995, we had already correlated left temporal lobe problems to violence. I called Andrew's pediatrician and asked him to find someone to drain the cyst. A week later, the pediatrician called me back and said he talked to three neurologists and none of them recommended we do anything about this cyst. They said it probably had nothing to do with his problems and wouldn't operate and these are the words they used, and wouldn't operate 
unless he had real symptoms. Confused, I said, I have a homicidal, suicidal boy who attacks people for no reason. What do you mean by real symptoms? I think they mean seizures or he loses consciousness. The doctor replied defensively. I said, this is insanity, and hung up. Frustrated, I called the pediatric neurosurgery department at UCLA and talked to Dr. Jorge Lazare, who later became famous for separating the Guatemalan twins who were connected at their heads. He was famous to me before then because when I told him about Andrew, he said, when cysts are symptomatic, we drain them. Obviously, Andrew has serious symptoms. No kidding, I thought to myself. After surgery, I received two phone calls. One was from his mother, who was so relieved. Sherry told me that the surgery went really well, and that when Andrew woke up from it, he smiled at her. She said, Danny, he hasn't smiled for a year. <laughs> the second call was from Dr. Lazarev, who said, oh my god, Dr. Raymond, that cyst was so aggressive and put so much pressure on Andrew's brain that it actually thinned the bone over his left temporal lobe. His temporal bone was eggshell thin. If he'd been hit in the head with a basketball, it would have killed him instantly. Either way, Andrew would have been dead in six months if you hadn't persisted. That day, I became even more passionate about our work. And I didn't care anymore if you liked me. And I was ready to take on the fight of my life. When someone's behavior is off, how do we really know why unless we look at the brain? Now, 23 years later, Andrew is married, employed, owns his own home. Because someone thought about his brain, he has been a wonderful son and husband and will be a better father and grandfather.